Thank you, Nico, for the kind introduction. Um, it's after lunch for me, too, uh, but I'm here to uh, actually, I'm just going to say it, I'm going to make a pitch for uh, introducing genetic diversity into the kinds of gene function screens that the, the comp program has, has pioneered. Um, before I get into my pitch, I, I want to pause and, and let's all look at this uh, iconic diagram. I'm sure everybody in the room knows what it is. This is a gene-gene um, interaction map of all the, essentially all the genes in the yeast genome. I was very lucky in, at the point in time when uh, Charlie Boone, Brenda Andrews, and, and company uh, had done all the single knockouts in yeast to be invited to be on their advisory board, and I got to watch them wrestle with, okay, we've knocked them all out, so what? Uh, and then they came up with the idea, well, let's put them all together in all possible pairs, and clearly that was going to be impossible. There was no way we could make all 36 million. And let me just say, um, you know, uh, creativity, corner cutting, and brute force, uh, they did it. Now, they didn't study ribosome function or RNA processing or any of the uh, functions that you see listed on this diagram. All they looked at is growth in permissive media. And they tracked uh, pairwise epistasis between the genes. And the graph itself is constructed in a particular way. Um, it's called a topological overlap map, and it's actually the same algorithm that Facebook uses to suggest friends to you. Um, if gene A is epistatic with a bunch of genes and gene B is epistatic with a similar bunch of genes, then you draw a connection between A and B. And then doing that, miraculously, genes that are sharing the same function start to cluster together. And you can start to do this guilt by association and assign function to genes of unknown function. So just hold that thought, and we're not going to propose to knock out all the genes in the mouse two at a time. That's clearly impossible. Um, but here's, uh, here's what I do want to talk about. Is the mouse a good model for human biology? And I'm just going to say mostly yes. Uh, I'd also like to uh, just make the point that the genetic background matters. And then I'm going to propose some study designs that I think are eminently practical and show you how those study designs can lead us to better understanding of function. So um, as a mouse geneticist, I often encounter people who kind of want to break into the field and study their favorite trait in the mouse. And they always ask me this question, which mouse is most like the human? And the answer, obviously, is C57, black 6, J or N, take your choice. Um, and we always have the concern, I always have the concern that even though it's, it's very important to study C57 black mice, you're really studying one mouse and one genome and, you know, it's, it's a room full of Waldos. But if we could look at genetic diversity in mice, we might more accurately model the kind of diversity that we, uh, that we see in human populations. And uh, if I had a laser pointer, I could show you where Waldo is, but he's in there. Uh, so we're not missing out on anything, but by bringing in uh, lots of genetic diversity, we actually get to see many, many uh, new and unexpected phenotypes. There are at least 20 papers in the past two years that address the question, and they go back further too, of whether the mouse is a, is a good model for humans. I chose this one because I like the picture, the little cartoon that I stole. Um, and there are just two points that I want to emphasize that were made in this paper. And one is that the allele and the strain in which the target mutation, and um, we'll address alleles in a minute, uh, in which a target mutation is maintained can make a big difference to the phenotype. And as a minor point, but one that's going to play into my hand here, litter mate controls are ideal. So. Um, a. Palmer's group, uh, many people have done this too, but a couple years ago did a really uh, heroic experiment where he took some of his favorite uh, um, uh, mutation, mutations and crossed them onto a whole panel of inbred lab strains. The design here is, uh, is pretty important for us. Um, I think this works. No? 
I'm going to go back. Anyway, the, um, the donor of the mutation is a heterozygote. Yep. And um, by crossing this heterozygote to uh, a number of strains, he generates a whole panel in which, among other things, um, one has litter-made controls. These animals are heterozygous, and these animals are basically wild type for the mutation. Every one of them is an F1 hybrid, half C57 black 6, half something else. And you can go look at the paper yourself. Uh, these backgrounds all affect the trait, but the backgrounds also affect, in some cases, the direction in which the mutation changes the phenotype. Uh, so it's just one example, and there are many, many more. Uh, this is also true, uh, I think, I'm not a medical geneticist, but I suspect that it's pretty universal that when diseases are segregating in families, there's always variability in the expression of the disease. Um, one explanation for that is, you know, well, there could be many explanations. There's environmental things that could be going on, uh, but one uh, very likely explanation is that there are other genes segregating in these families that are modifiers. And uh, this is a very tip of the iceberg list of uh, human diseases that are not only known to have modifier genes, but the modifiers have been identified and the mechanism by which the modifier acts has been identified. And in, in my opinion, modifier genes are just uh, an open door to therapeutics. If you have a gene dysfunction, and you have another gene that modifies it, you have at least one angle to take to, you know, how do I address the primary mutation with a therapy? So human diseases have modifier genes. So I'm going to segue a little bit and talk about genetically diverse reference populations. Anybody who's heard me talk in the past 15 years has heard this ad nauseum. I apologize. But there's something, you know, that, that I would like to say here, and that is, um, we attempted to make many, many uh, collaborative cross strains. Our um, collaborative cross paper came out right after the, the, the comp paper. Um, and if you look at them, they're very similar. Uh, they, they both were vision papers, and um, at the time we had no mice. And in fact, we had no mice 10 years ago, we had no mice 5 years ago, we had no mice 2 years ago, but pretty much now, except for people at UNC who's got, who have first dibs. Uh, if you want a collaborative cross mice, you couldn't get them. So there's no way this thing could be a failure because it didn't exist, and it does exist now. There are many, many fewer strains than we thought there would be, but along the way, uh, we did something sneaky, and we siphoned off mice, and we made an outbred population. And the outbred population is easily available, um, and it might seem a little scary, but I'd like to talk you through it. So in a cartoon here, we have basically three genetic resources. We have eight strains that are the founders. Uh, we have approximately 70 plus or minus 20 inbred strains that have the same genetic complements as the outbred strains, and there are infinitely many um, outbred strains, as many as you care to make, and they're all unique. Um, like I said, if, if this makes you nervous, just think about when you order a strain from the Jackson Lab, you, there's a strain number, you call up services, and they send you a box of mice, and they're all black. Or if they're balb seeds, they're all white or something. Well, if you order strain number 009376, and that's all you have to do, they're readily available, they're going to come in all flavors. And these are just uh, some, these are actually uh, single litters of DO mice. There's nothing special about them. They're just a lot of mice, and you can phenotype them. In fact, um, we did that. We've done that in a few studies now, and one of the big concerns that people raise about outbred mice is, oh, the studies can't be reproduced. They are not reproducible. Uh, this, is a, this is a chart from a plot from a paper that we published on uh, benzene exposure using DO mice. Uh, at low exposure, there's very little DNA damage, but uh, when we get up to 100 ppm, some of the mice uh, show high levels of DNA damage. We did the experiment once with about 300 mice, and then six months later, we did the experiment again with 300 more mice. And in my mind, that is highly reproducible. 
we have reproduced exactly the same uh, mean phenotype and the variance, and um, you know, they're mice and uh, they're reproducible. So how can we use the outbred mice to do phenotype screens? Uh, there are many, many ways that you could come up with in your imagination, and I just want to show you a couple, one very simple one. Uh, there's a dominant mutation phenotype screen. Let's imagine that we have a mutation, this yellow star here, and it's on a C57 black 6N background, and I have a heterozygous breeder, and I cross it to a DO mouse, and I get four offspring and I cross it to another DO mouse and another DO mouse, say, you know, 20 or 30 or 50 of them, I'm gonna get a whole population of animals that are F1 hybrids, one half of their genome being B6 and the other half being diverse. So we're putting this mutation on a diverse genetic background and we're also getting built-in litter mate controls. And if I were to do this experiment, I would do it blind. I would just take the litters, I would phenotype them, when the, everything is said and done, I would go back and genotype them, and I would know then which ones carried the mutation and which ones didn't. It's a very clean, very simple experiment, not unlike the A. Palmer experiment, but much more practical logistically because the DO mice are just a strain, right? And you can just order them, and these matings, they're going to be highly productive. Um, one has to be concerned about sample size because outbred mice are more variable. Uh, this is a very generic sample size curve, but I want to point out that um, the, the effect size of a mutation should always be measured in standard deviation units. Uh, standard deviations are going to be bigger in an outbred population, and an effect size of one standard deviation is a pretty good target. If you get much smaller, you have no hope, and if you get much larger, you're going to get it every time. So really, when you're evaluating sample size, you want to be looking right around here on the curves. And what you're going to see is that at a reasonable alpha level of, you know, you're going to, you want to do some multiple test corrections for your um, multiple phenotypes, but between, you know, 25 and 50 mice is going to be per group, so you'd have to generate 50 or 100 per mutation is going to be an excellent sample size with sufficient power to do a good um, mutant screen. Now, I want to come back to this, uh, this diagram from the benzene experiment. And you can think not of benzene as an environmental exposure, but if benzene were the mutation that you introduced onto the mouse, what you're going to notice is these mice that are barely or not at all exposed to benzene, they're just, nothing's happening. But in the exposure group, the variance goes up. The mean goes up for sure, but the variance explodes too. And that is the key to understanding when there might be modifier genes in the background. And so you want to have an experiment that's sufficiently powered to detect changes in variance. And those are a little trickier to, to, to detect, but if you uh, look for a two-fold change in variance um, and you want 80% power, uh, you're going to need 100 mice. So it's not ridiculous, it's not out of reach. You could do uh, a screen to look for a shift in the mean trait and a slightly bigger screen using the same mice to look for a change in variance. If you see this change in variance, you're gonna be pretty sure there's some modifier genes in the background. Oh, you can do this with recessives too. It takes two generations instead of one and there are multiple ways to do it and I'm just gonna move on and say that, you know, if you suspect there are modifier genes in the background, you can go after them. Uh, we did this recently uh, with a modifier of PYMT and cancer mis metastases. Uh, this is um, a really nice effort by Nigel Crawford, who validated the genes in uh, human cancer patients. Uh, but what I really want to talk about at, and to wrap up is a cross that was done in Ron Corstania's lab to look at Alport syndrome. Alport is X-linked, and X-linked genes give us just another variation on how we can, uh, can do these modifier crosses. So if we take an X-linked uh, Alport mutation, which is a collagen mutation, uh, cross it with some uh, DO mice, and we get a bunch of offspring, we get females that are het, and we get males that are hemizygous for the mutation. Uh, the mutation causes a disruption in the basement membrane in the kidney, which causes the kidneys to be leaky, so protein gets into the urine. Uh, it also causes inflammation and the glomeruli drop off, and so you get reduced filtration. 
and you see uh, females are mildly affected and males are severely affected. And um, that's no surprise because the males are, are hemizygous. But what we, uh, what we wanted to do next is um, take those, uh, let me see the cross here. Oh, I left it off. Um, I'll show you this one. Okay, that's where the cross went. So what we wanted to do next was uh, validate that this uh, gene RFX3, which we mapped using 100 DO mice, um, is actually a modifier. We kind of had a good idea because we mapped it, but mapping's never proof. So what we did is we took a B6 knockout mouse, probably a comp, more likely we made it with CRISPR, Ron did this, and we cross it to um, a call for a five mutant, and we get uh, four groups of mice. We get the female, um, all the mice have the call for a five mutant. We get the females with and without the modifier, the males with and without the modifier. This is an ongoing experiment, but this group here, females with the modifier, you can see them, they're living a long time. Uh, this group here, uh, this group here, males without the modifier, these are the ones that are dropping off fast. So there's a way to, to validate your uh, modifier gene candidates. Um, we also looked at the proteinuria phenotype. Uh, in this case, we found uh, two modifiers. Uh, I'd like to point out that you know, these LOD scores are not earth shattering, they're pretty weak candidates, but we have functional evidence and we're gonna go forward and validate them. Um, these validations are ongoing, but just like the other picture, in this case, the only um, background we had the, the modifier on was an FVB background. So, um, you know, this is a, a slightly mixed uh, background um, validation experiment for the modifier. So, phenotype screens using single inbred strains may miss important effects or may fail to generalize. I guess I didn't talk about that much because I think it's kind of obvious. Um, phenotype screens with uh, genetic diversity are reproducible, they're simple, and they require manageable sample sizes. And if you do such a screen, you can then go on to identify modifier genes, you can detect them, you can identify the genes, and you can validate them. And they add significant new knowledge about gene function. In fact, what they're doing for you is they're prioritizing which pairwise knockouts you should make in your all pairwise knockouts of the mouse model. Um, gets us a little bit closer to, um, we all have a little yeast envy here, right? So it uh, gets us a little closer to being yeast geneticists. And um, there are many people to thank, but I just really want to acknowledge uh, primarily Ron Corstania for the, for the Alport uh, studies, which he was really bold to undertake. And uh, just to make a final pitch for, you know, genetic uniformity versus genetic diversity. And I talked a long time, so we're going to save questions for later. Thank you.